that the ash gone up to where they gather on the hills of God. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus anywhere, everywhere. I would follow God. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus everywhere He leads me. Please remain standing. Amen. And I, I believe that you tonight believe that with all your heart. Anywhere he leads me, I will follow on. So good to have you. I'll go ahead and apologize up front to our on-stream folks and, uh, as, and folks here as well that uh, I do not have a tie on tonight. And probably on Wednesday nights, I may not just because of going door-to-door -door soul winning. And if I have a tie on when I go to the door, and they're going to wonder what's gone wrong or something like that. And uh, sometimes, like tonight, uh, I finish at just the last minute and have to come running in. So I apologize for that. And yet, what an opportunity. We had, I think, I believe, it's the best turnout we've had for soul winning tonight as far as the number. Not a large number, and yes, some of them are downstairs with the children and all. But, uh, but we had some good visits and uh, met a lady who knows Roy Perry, who knew Roy Perry's mother. And uh, this is Mrs. McCall is her name and uh, lives over on a street, <laughs> all right? Uh, whatever the name of that street is, Brother Allen can tell you. But, uh, and she knows the Lord is her savior, a Methodist lady, 90 something years old. And we just had a good time of chatting and uh, talking about some of her relatives that are not saved. And so, old-time Methodist, and uh, I like to hear, my mother and father were led to the Lord by an old-time Methodist. And I've told you that story, and so I'm very grateful for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing then on the service tonight. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity of being here. And Lord, we're excited that uh, we have this privilege. We've already been to a lot of homes right here in our neighborhood, but there's still a lot to go. And so, Father, one at a time, we have the privilege of meeting those who already know you, like this dear lady, and others who have yet to accept your Son. And that's our privilege, to remind them of their need of the Savior. But, Father, that was earlier this evening, and now tonight we have the privilege of opening thy word and singing, having some divine fellowship, and yet also going to the Word of God and then praying with and for each other. So we would ask thy blessing on all of those activities for your honor and for your glory, and we'll thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated as our brother comes. Amen. Just have the one announcement tonight, the, uh, and it's just a reminder of uh, those uh, that the church has invited to Roy and Margaret's golden anniversary drop-in celebration on August the 27th. That'll be from 2 to 5 p.m. And tonight is the actual deadline for signing or doing the RSVP to Miss Tabitha Black. So uh, if those who would like to come, the church is invited, everyone can come, and those that don't know them or those that have known them. So uh, please remember that. And it says, please, no gifts. And then I guess I could mention the uh, homecoming on the 25th of September, and then our uh, missions conference, the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, I believe I have that right. 12th through the 16th. Uh, the 16th through the 19th. Mm -hmm. It has the 16 in there. Yeah. <laughs> 19 through 23. Oh, 19 through the 23rd? Yes. Yeah. Really? Through the 23rd. Okay. I apologize. Doesn't have the 16 in there. That's what I meant to say. It does not have the 16 in there. <laughs> Maybe the six needs to be turned up anyway. <laughs> All right. Well, he is, was accurate the way it started at the very beginning, but shortly after that, um, someone may remember that we had to change it because we couldn't find any missionaries to come. Uh, they, they, because of my just coming basically in February, even though I started, but we moved here in February, and I tried and tried and tried and tried. I talked to just all kinds of our missionaries, well not all kinds, but several of our missionaries, 
and uh, they are not coming to the states or they're not coming south or whatever it is, uh, south from Maine or south from Alaska or whatever, and uh, that time of year. And so then I began to have one or two that said I could come for one day next week, though. And so then I, I said, well... Okay, I'll sign at least one. Maybe what we'll do is have one Sunday every month for missions. I think I even mentioned that in here. But then I started having another one saying, you know, if you could have me come, I could come on that, that next day. And I could come on that. So it, we're full from Sunday through, or for Wednesday through Sunday. And uh, starting with uh, just, it's just going to be great. And we won't go into all the detail. We'll tell you more about it as we're going about it, but uh, just we're going to have a great missions conference. It'll be different this year uh, because they're not going to stay all week long or the Wednesday through Sunday. Uh, most of them will just be staying one night or one evening for, or Sunday uh, for, um, uh, you know, Wednesday through Sunday for that service and then going on to wherever else it was they're already already scheduled but what a joy to have them call and then we're going to have a couple more come uh, before and after and so it's just we're going to have a bunch of missionaries coming uh, here in the next few weeks and looking forward to it well I'm looking forward to it as well and I'm glad that you're with us glad to have our live stream folks I think I called you on stream this time uh, but live stream folks with us and uh, we're glad to have you here tonight Tell you what we're going to do, we're going to get right into the Word of God, and uh, we're going to be in Proverbs chapter number 15 tonight, and uh, fellas, if you want to be ready to teach Proverbs 16 next Wednesday night, next Wednesday night, pick a passage of scripture from Proverbs chapter 16. Now, we have a good number of our men not here tonight, and so, um, and so you can have first pickings, if we can put it that way. And any of our live stream folks, if you want to come and you're a member of Calvary and uh, want to participate in the opening of the Word of God from something you've studied, not at the last minute, but all week long, studied chapter 16 and find some real nuggets of truth. And uh, I'll be looking forward to that. And so let's go ahead and find out. Do we have some men who will be ready for next Wednesday night? Proverbs chapter 16. Now we're going to take a break probably after chapter 16 because we're more than half of the way through. And, um, and so we're going to take just a, a two or three week break and do something different. And then we'll come back and finish out the month or the, uh, the study of Proverbs. But how many of you will take a, how many of you gentlemen will take a passage of scripture? All right, there's one, there's two. I can't tell if your hand's up or not, Brother Don. Is that you, brother? Yes, three. All right, Brother Josh is four, Brother Mills five. All right, good, good, good. All right, and some of you other men that haven't, if you would like to, uh, we won't charge you any extra for that. We really won't. And uh, if you'll just study and let me know at the last minute, we may have to make it two weeks like we did before. But that's all right. It was good enough to make it for two weeks. Well, with that in mind, are you ready to go to the Word of God? Let's do it. Proverbs chapter 15, and with your permission, I'm going to bring the podium down here. And so, live stream, folks, if you'll hang on, we're going to move the podium. And uh, I can get this, Brother Jesse. I can just carry it with my right arm, so we're good on that. Left arm? We probably want to do it too much. Do you have a surgery schedule for I don't yet. We're, you know, we're working on that. So, we're going to. See, I'm not anxious to do it yet. <laughs> but it needs to be done. Needs to be done. All right. I called Brother Travis. Caused Brother Travis to backslide, didn't I? All right. Well, let us just keep coming back. There. <laughs> All right, Proverbs chapter 16, but please tell your wife we're missing her. Proverbs chapter 15 tonight, yes, all right. Sorry about that, all right. We better have a word of prayer and then get started, all right. Let's pray. Father, we do love you, and it's good to have some fun, uh, even though it's fun sometimes because of just not uh, just saying it incorrectly, and yet it's just, it's okay. But Father, as we look to your word, 
We're so excited about it, Father. It's, I know as I studied this text, and look for something particular, and you gave it to me. It was wonderful, Lord, and I get to share it with these I love and whom you love. And so, Lord, I pray that your blessing will be upon us now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. While you're turning your Bibles to chapter 16, and then you go back a chapter, and you'll be right where the rest of us are, all right? While you're doing that, let me remind you of Wednesday night, soul winning. Uh, again, we're going to start Saturday mornings here before long, but uh, yes, it's, it, it takes effort. It does. Um, we had a good meal tonight. Um, what's the name of the place? We went to, I went to Hot Dog World, and I bought, I forget how many hot dogs, I bought cheeseburgers, I bought uh, chicken sandwiches, I bought french fries, I bought salad, I bought uh, coleslaw, uh, I bought New York strip, no I didn't, uh, but I bought a, a, all of those things and so we just had a feast. We had a good time with hot dogs tonight. Tonight was the mystery night, you never know what you're going to get, and, uh, but it was all good and uh, first time I've had a cheeseburger from there and it won't be the last, Lord willing. Unless I go to heaven, and I'm going to see if I can maybe get a to-go box or something. <laughs> and uh, that was really, really good. Put a little chili on it and a little slaw on it and a potato, not a potato, a tomato. And uh, it was just delicious. So all that to say this, don't let anything keep you from... Now, you don't have to come Wednesday night. Just carry these little tracks with you. And we have, we just happen to have enough on the way, 5,000. And so, uh, and then we have fi uh, 50 follow-up books. And so, uh, and you never know who you're going to meet. Uh, we're live streamed, so I won't go into it. But this lady that I met tonight is very, very, very concerned for one of her loved ones uh, who's extremely bright um, and just very intelligent in, in, a, in a scientific way and yet rejects everything that has anything to do and accepts everything that has nothing to do with fact as far as the environment, as far as uh, the world and the creation of it and things like that, and putting his faith in something that can't be substantiated. It's just, just a matter of faith. But you and I have the blessed Word of God that substantiates our faith. Amen? Scientifically accurate, historically accurate, mathematically accurate. Just you put it to any test and it's going to be accurate. And so we praise the Lord for that. So I hope that you'll, if it's not in your schedule, you don't even really need to pray about it because you have a command. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. He talks about going to the highways and hedges. Compel them to come in. Talking about filling up the bride of Christ for the bridegroom. And so I hope that, I hope that you'll kind of put that into your schedule. We had several tonight that have never been before. We had two or three tonight that have never been before. And yet they put that fear aside. I don't know that they were afraid, but... I know I would be, and they put it aside to where they'd go and knock on someone's door. And uh, I know I had a delightful visit. I stayed at one house, and uh, we talked a lot about our unsaved loved ones. But um, others had good visits as well. So I hope that you'll make that Wednesday nights at 5 o'clock, and we have a meal together, and then we scoot out, and we just go door to door. And uh, we're all the way past the gas station now, and the first two streets past the gas station. We're working our way up. And uh, we'd love for you to be a part of it. All right, enough of that. So here's what we did. Here's what I did. Is as I was reading it, and I read it several times through, so I just kind of get a, a, an overview, like being up in an airplane 500 feet or so, 1,000, 2,000 feet, and you look down, and you can see things differently from up there than you do when you're down here. Now, you need to be keep your feet on the ground most of the time and just go verse by verse and fact by fact and so forth, but sometimes it's good to just kind of get up above it and read it over and over and over. Uh, years ago, I tried to, and I, I haven't followed it through all the way, but I tried to read a passage of Scripture a hundred times before I, before I really started to try to preach it. I've probably uh, at least 10 to 15 times, um, whether it's a, a book like James, I'd read James through the whole book all the way through, um, in its entirety, or the book of Philippians, they're short books, and read them through over and over and over and over and over and over, so that you really have a lot of it memorized, but, but what you're really trying to do is saturate your mind with those specific principles, so that when you do a study, that you're not going to contradict something it says later on, not knowing the context. And so, I didn't read this over 50, 100 times, 
but I just, I did several times. And I looked at it and said, Lord, help me to see what stands out that, would, that you know who's going to be here. You know, Miss Gretchen's going to be here. And Brother Roger, you know uh, who's going to be here, just each one of you. And, and who's going to be listening online? So, Lord, help me to pick out what's needed for their lives, even this evening, for this week, and where they are where I am. All right? So, doing that, you'll notice that it says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue. And he goes on and talks about different things. So, what I did is what I, I did it once before, not intentionally this time, but I just, it just stood out to me as I was reading it through. So, then I went back and began to mark it. I marked each place where it brought out the capital letters L-O-R-D, L-O-R-D, Lord. And you're going to see that I believe it's six different times, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I guess, seven different times that Lord is used. All right, you see it in verse 3, verse 8, verse 9, verse 11, 16, 25, and 26. And so I began to look at each one of these individually And then what I did is I went back and said, all right, is there an accumulative effect of this? Is there something that when he's referring to the Lord, as he's talking about the tongue, he's talking about the eye, he's talking about different things in succession going through here, but seven different times he enlists the name of the Lord. He brings out the name of the Lord. And so that's what my eyes began to settle on and my heart as I begin to ask the Lord. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you those six or seven, and uh, as time permits, and we're going to try to give a little extra time for prayer tonight. Uh, The last couple of times I said, take these prayer requests home with you. But I think it's good if we take our prayer requests here too and uh, take them before the Lord. So we're going to try, I'm going to try to finish. We may not get all the way through the seven, but uh, we'll go as far as we can. not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I just want to show you what the Lord is trying to say in these different references to himself. So let's look at the very first one. And it says, this is verse number three. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Now, when we talk about the word of God, is it primarily written to God's people or to the unsaved? What would you say? Even though it's the Old Testament, we'll just call them saved if you're if we're referring to the saints of the Old Testament, all right? So would you say it's to God's people or to the unsaved, the majority of the Word of God? God's people, I agree with you, yes. Okay, so that being the case, when we read this verse, and at first it's, well, yeah, I know that, but let's think about it. Now, we're going to think about it later as it relates to all of these others, but let's take them solo. Let's take them one at a time. And see what it has to say. And then I believe we're going to begin to see God saying something here. He's saying something in these two or three verses. He skips a verse or two. And he says another thing, but then he skips another verse. And then there's two verses in succession. And we're going to see that, all right? So he says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding. The eyes of the Lord are in every place Beholding the evil and the good. All right? Now, we're not going to think deep in theology this evening, but let's just, let's just think about it a little bit. What's the general idea that he's trying to get across here? The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. So, let's, let's pick it apart for a moment. What are the various, I call them components, What are the various things that stand out, not necessarily by way of principle, what are the key words that you would say? Somebody give me one of the key words. Eyes. Eyes. What's another one? Beholding. Beholding. What's another one? Every. Every. Very good. I was looking for that one. How about another one? Evil. Evil. How about another one? Good. Good. All right. So I think we picked out most of the eyes of the Lord are in every place. Beholding. Okay. The evil and the good. What does the idea of beholding mean? What, somebody give me a dime store definition of beholding. What do you think? It's not hard. It's just considering. Considering. Is it usually just a quick, okay, in my peripheral, I saw a peanut butter milkshake over here. All right. 
No, if there's a peanut butter milkshake over there, even if it's my peripheral that saw it, as they say in South Georgia, it ain't the only thing that's going to happen. All right. I'm going to look and I'm going to say, ooh, that's not a small. That's not even a medium. That's a large. And the more I behold it, I notice it's not in a styrofoam cup. And I know that there's an ice cream churn next to it. And I know that there is a peanut cruncher, whatever they are. And I know there are ingredients. In other words, there's a difference between a common glance, just, okay, and beholding. It says the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding two things, the what and the what. That's right. So if we were to sum that up in today's English in Hendersonville, North Carolina, what does that verse say? What did you say? As God is my witness. Very good. Somebody else? Watching. Watching. I heard a bass voice back there somewhere. He sees everything. Okay. <laughs> Our sister, Mr. Alita, I, I, he was talking and she, her, I saw her lips moving and Brother Don was talking. I, <laughs> whoa, she's got a bad cold there. All right. Mr. No, he, he was right as what he was saying. Yes, he is right. Was it the same as you? Yes. Oh, they oh, had a duet. All right. Good. All right. And I, now you got tickled with that and forgot what you said. What was it, Miss Arlita? He sees everything. He sees everything. Okay. So when you put all these pieces together as my witness and you put all these things together, what's it really saying? He's everywhere. Okay. What does that mean to you? I'm never alone. Oh, but now let's think about that for a second. If you're never alone... What does that mean? He's all around. Okay, let's think about the all around. The Greek word for that is peripateo. If, you, if you're walking, and there's a word for walking in a straight line like soldiers would do. There's another word for just walking, just walking around. Okay, let's pretend that it's the peripateo. You're just walking around. You're at work or you're playing with the grandkids or you're, you're doing whatever you're doing on vacation. You're just walking around. And what is this verse saying? Is God with you or not? Yes. Oh, but wait a minute. What if you are all of a sudden in the midst of a horrible setting, there's ungodliness going on, and I mean, it's, oh, oh, I know this grieves God. What is it saying about God? He's there. Does he give it a casual glance? No. What kind of... A, an observation does God make of your setting? He's beholding it. That's right. He is beholding your setting, no matter what that setting is. And so when you and I walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh, then we can have that wonderful assurance that it does not matter. It does not matter what kind of a setting I'm in. As long as, as long as I am in God's will, God is going to hear me, please. God is going to protect me from physical harm unless there is a higher priority. I believe that with all my heart. God's going to protect you Unless there is a higher priority. Now that, that onslaught may be a tumor. It may be, as I've had said to me, if this happens, I will kill you. Okay? Um, it may be that. And by the way, they never did. I just wanted to let you know, okay? I just, 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 just verification here. All right? So the point is, now sometimes there is a higher priority. Do you think God was not there when Nate Saint and the others were taking their canoes down the river in, in uh, Colum is it Columbia? No. Was it Columbia? Was that or Ecuador? Ecuador. It was Ecuador. You're right. It was in Ecuador. Do you think God wasn't there? God didn't see those Indians with their bows and ready to let them have it? Or was God there? Was there a higher priority? Yes. Was there a higher priority when God called Becky's husband home? Or my wife home, there's a higher priority. 
may not know all of it until we get to eternity. I, I, I think I know as far as Becky, I mean as far as my first wife, because God has used her in a marvelous way since she's been in heaven. I've been able to use her testimony hundreds and hundreds of times as I've traveled with people through difficult times, and I've, I've tutored them in the grace that I learned by watching my wife as she went through all that. Here's my point, and I've, I've probably gone longer than I should have on this. We're not going to get through. But the point is, when we stop and we look at the eyes of the Lord are at every place beholding the evil and the good. Yes, God is omnip omnipresent as well as omnipotent and omniscient. He's omnipresent. Okay, I got it. I got it. But what does that mean to Helen's life? What does that mean to uh, Brother uh, uh, Mills's life? What does that mean to Sister Sylvia's life? It means if I'm doing something in the closet and no one knows about it, God does. Or if I'm doing something and I don't really want anybody to know about it, but it was a very good thing, God knows about it. I don't have to go out, doo -doo -doo -doo. everybody look at Randy Bray. No, oh, aren't you lucky I'm here? No, no, no. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to what? That's right. So you're exactly right, friend. So the point is that God is everywhere and he is beholding the good and the evil. And we're going to see that all the way through this chapter. We're not going to look at all the chapter, but we're going to look at six more things very quickly. All right, so that's number one. Number two is found in verse number eight. Notice what it says, the sacrifice, and by the way, most of these, not all, most of these are by way of contrast. It's a teaching by way of contrast. It's like, okay, there's a difference between an avocado and, uh, uh, let's say, peanut butter pie. Okay, there is, that's, that would be definitely the epitome of contrast, all right? Uh, peanut butter pie, yes, all right? Uh, avocado, oh my, that's not right. We need to pray for revival here, all right? But here's the point, here's the point, is that most of these verses in this are saying there's this, but this is what God does, or God does this, and there's the other. So you see that in verse 8. The sacrifice of the wicked. There you go. Now, wait a minute. Sacrifice. What does sacrifice mean? Hurry, hurry, hurry. What does it mean? It, it's an offering. Okay. What's, what is understood in the, in the very term sacrifice? Cost. It's what? Cost. Cost. I'm giving something up. I'm sacrificing. Okay. So when Abraham offered Isaac on the altar, was that a sacrifice? Yes or no? Was it a righteous thing? Yes, but do the wicked sacrifice? Oh, sure they do. Sure they do, okay? So he says the, wicked, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. He uses that word, I think, uh, three other, two other times, but we'll look at that another day. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but notice this, the prayer of the righteous, or upright, which means righteous, but the prayer of the upright would you look at that last little phrase? Why don't we say it together? Is his what? Stop and think about that. Sister Sylvia, do you want to delight the Lord? You can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Each one of us here, Brother Steve, you can delight the Lord. Brother Roger, you can delight the Lord. Now, he is saying, he's contrasting what's going on. He says, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. Now, the sacrifice of Isaac on the altar was part of what gave uh, God the, the, uh, the conclusion. I hate to put it that. It's not the right way to put it. But God assessed Abraham's faith as being righteous because he was willing to trust God, even though it meant taking his son's life. That sacrifice was deemed righteous. But he's not even talking here about the sacrifice of the missionary who leaves the borders of America and maybe a great, a great place like America as uh, the heir to the Borden dynasty did, as God called him to preach, and he legally... His, his parents, everybody thought he was insane. He legally made it to where he could not receive any of the Borden fortune as he surrendered to go to the field and he died very young. But he surrendered. He's not even talking about that surrender and sacrifice here. 
Notice what he says. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the what? Oh, wow. Sacrifice is usually an overt thing. You do it outwardly. It's the calf on the, on the, on the altar. It's whatever the sacrifice is. It's usually, not all the time, sometimes it can be, it can be secret, but a lot of times it's, it's out there where you see it, others probably see it. But prayer oftentimes is very different from that. You're in your time with the Lord. It's not necessarily a secret. Your spouse may know it, your parents may know it, your friend may know it. That You get up at whatever time or at the evening at whatever time and that's when you're with the Lord. But notice what he says, the sacrifice of the wicked is abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright doesn't say that you've been to Bible college, though that's a good thing. He doesn't say that you're the most talented or the brightest, the most well-to-do, the who's who. For me, I'm more in the book of the what's what, all right? And they have to figure me out yet, all right? But that, it doesn't mean that. It says this, but the prayer of the upright is what? His delight. It's not just a delight. It's his delight. You know what that means, Mrs. Mills? You can delight the Lord tonight. You can do it. Just walk with the Lord. You say, preacher, I've, I've got some problems. God wouldn't classify me as upright. Well, then get right with the Lord and you will be. That's all you have to do. Put pride aside. This old-fashioned altar, I, I don't invite to come, folks to come to the altar so that I feel like I've preached a successful message because 99% of the messages I pray, I just tell you, no big deal. I want to say 99. 95% of the messages I preach, I, when I leave the pulpit, like many preachers, when I leave the pulpit, I feel like it's a total failure. But I've learned through all these years that that's just the old flesh's way of getting back. And trying to convince me, I just quit. God just, you know, why has anybody ever come back? Now, hopefully you don't think that either. But why, why, why has anybody ever come back? And I've just learned through the years, boy, it's, I struggle with it. I struggled diligently with it. Just diligently with it for several years when God called me to pastor. I just felt inept. I felt just whatever. Until it finally got through my thick head as I heard preacher after preacher talk about the same thing. And just say, wait a minute, this is how the devil works. He says, the prayer of the upright is his delight. Let me just journey there for a second and we'll go on. There is nothing, nothing, nothing. Ms. Tunstall, can I rephrase that one again? There's nothing that keeps you from being a delight to the Lord in your prayer life but you. Your flesh can't make you do that. The, your no, no outside entity, no outside power, no outside individual can keep you from being a delight to the Lord. My great aunt, you've heard me tell about it. She and my great uncle were married 66 years or 63 years. I forget how many years, 60 something years. Shortly after, I mean, she got saved. He, I mean, shortly after they got married, he got, she got saved. He forbade her for going to church for all those years. She passed away shortly after she passed away. I don't know how long, but shortly after she passed away, he got saved and wonderfully saved. Amen. I had never met him. I did meet him at my grandmother's funeral. He knew I was a preacher. I probably told this. I, I, I haven't, okay? Uh, thank you for doing that, brother. So it helps. Yes, yes, no, no. All right. Uh, but my grandmother's funeral uh, up in Illinois... And I didn't, I didn't know any, hardly any, if any, of my relatives up there. And there's some reasons for that. I won't go into it tonight. But um, my great uncle, here's a room full of my relatives, whom I'd met for the first time, many of them for the first time. And just the room was packed. Big family. My, bro, my dad had, I think, eight brothers and several sisters. Big family. And so my uncle, and I don't even know his name, my uncle called out. And he says, Randy! I th what did I do? And uh, he says, I got a question for you. Of course, when you got a guy that's 90-something years old or whatever, 98, whatever he was, 93, I think. 
Well, he was 92 when he got saved, so I don't know how, long, how old he was, but somewhere in there. He said, I got a question for you, Randy. And I said, yes, sir. He said, did I wait too long to get saved? And what he was doing was just kind of tossing me a softball to give the gospel to the rest of my dad's relatives, my relatives too. And the Lord gave me the answer. I said, well, uncle, in one way, yes. I wish you and my great aunt could have lived your entire lifetime. And he, by record, treated her very nicely. He just wouldn't let her go to church other than that. I said, I wish you could have known the Lord early in your marriage and just enjoyed that. I said, so yes, I wish you could have, but at the same time, uncle, no, you didn't wait too late. Did you accept the Lord as your Savior? I did. No, you didn't wait too late because you'll see her again. He gave me the opportunity just by testimony to give the gospel out. Now notice what he says. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. Yes, it is. Every single time. Every time. But the prayer of the upright is for you, Brother Allen, for each one of you, for me too, all of our friends listening by way of online. Make sure you have that time with the Lord and walking with the Lord, and you'll delight Him. Okay? We've got to hurry. The third one is in verse number 9. Notice what it says. The way of the wicked, the way of the wicked is an abomination of the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Okay? Let's pick out the key words there again. We're going to have to do it very quickly, though, and I'll, I'll fly. All right? So give me the key words. This is, I'll read it one more time. The way of the wicked is an abomination of the Lord, but he loveth, talking about God, loveth, him that followeth after righteousness. Give me key words, quick, quick, quick. Okay, uh, <laughs> maybe not all at once, all right? Uh, let's see. Somebody hadn't answered yet on this side. Abomination. Abomination. Another one over on this side. Way. Another one on this side. Follow. Follow. Another one on this side. Loveth. What was it? Loveth. Loveth. Okay. Let's see if you got them all. Da -da 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 -da. I think it's one more. Righteousness. righteousness. All right. So let's look at it again. Notice what he's contrasting. The way of the wicked is an abomination. There's key words. Way, wicked, and abomination unto the Lord. Okay? But he loveth. What word would that be in opposition to? Okay? Well, it says God loveth. What, what word? Let me pick a different word. Abomination. Okay? All right. So let's go on. The way of the wicked is abomination of the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth. Okay? What word would that be in contradiction to? Way is exactly right. Somebody over here is way. Okay? After righteousness, and righteousness would be in contrast to what? Wicked. Very good. Very good. Here's the principle the Lord is just, again... And, and I probably make it too simple. It's just the way my mind works. But when I read this and looked at it and asked the Lord to help me and to help you, here's what the Lord gave me, I think. Righteousness always creates pathways. God loves and the Christian can follow. Righteousness always creates pathways God loves, and the Christian can follow. Well, wait a minute, preacher. What about the, what about the, the uh, all the trials in Egypt? What's the other word for it? Not trials. What's the other word? Plagues. The what? Plagues, yes. What about all the plagues in Egypt? Do you remember what God said why he sent them? He sent one to lead children out of Israel, right? Israel out of Egypt, right? Children of Israel out of Egypt. What's the other reason God did that? The Bible says, so that all what? So that all Egypt would know that there is a what? In heaven. Okay? God's pathways. Now, sometimes it swallows up. Poor sons. Into a boom. They're gone. Okay? But that was a pathway for everyone watching. Better be careful what we say. Better be careful what we do. Okay? So, 
Righteous, all, righteous always creates pathways for them. Okay, let's go to verse number 11. And we have to hurry here. Verse number 11. Hell and destruction, there's the key components, before the Lord, are before the Lord. How much more? Think about this now. Okay. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more? Hell and destruction. What does it mean, hell and destruction before the Lord? What does that mean? Quick, quick. Somebody help me. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. There you go. He knows all about hell, doesn't he? He created it for the devil and his angels. Destruction. Okay. Uh, then, when, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what? Death or the destruction or the corruption of everything that we do according to the flesh. Okay. Um, the soul that sinneth, it shall surely what? Die. We can go on and on and on. All right. So hell and destruction before the Lord. That means the Lord knows everything about hell. He knows it's a bottomless pit. He knows it's the center of the earth, the Bible says. He knows that wherever it is, all right? He knows everything about hell. Just like he does photosynthesis. Just like he does thermodynamics. Just like he does whatever. Everything. Now, notice something else. Hmm. It's an interesting phrase. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more? How much more then, not then, then, I'm sorry for the pause there. My, my eyes looked at it like it was an A, and I thought, that's not right. Okay, it's then, not then. Am I correct on that? Yes. Okay. The hell and destruction before the Lord, how much more then the hearts of the children of men? Somebody give me a New Testament verse that's consistent with that commentary. How about John chapter 3, verse 16? For God so loved the elect that he gave his only begotten Son. Is that what it says? For God so loved the the Bible says he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible says about Jesus, as we've looked in John chapter 1, that he is the light, the true light. Verse number 9, that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. This struck me for this study as I've never been struck before out of this text. This is a commentary on the depth of the love of God. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more then? If that's in his mind, if he understands it, he knows the circumference, he knows the depth, he knows the first one that's cast into the lake of fire yet to be, yet to be instituted. Because the beast and the false prophet are going to be there. And the Bible says in the Dell. The devil will be cast into the lake of fire where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. He knows when the beast and the false prophet, the, 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 uh, false, the antichrist and the false prophet, they're the first inhabitants to the lake of fire. The Bible says, and the institutions of death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. So even though I don't know if the lake of fire is in existence now, I don't know if it's yet to be created, I don't know. And I'd have to think about it. There may be scriptures that lie down. I'd, I'd have to think about it. But the point is, he knows when the first inhabitants are going to be there. He knows when the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet, and he knows when Satan's going to be cast there. He knows when the first inhabitant's going to be there of the human race. Following the great white throne judgment, it says, and, and the books will be opened, the book of life and the book of works. Actually, I got that in reverse. The book of works and the book of life will be opened. The last verse in that chapter after that says, and whosoever, that's all inclusive, was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. True or not? Very true. That is before the Lord. He understands that. He created that. He gave every one of those individuals the opportunity of knowing his son in one way or another. And they rejected it. That is before him all the time. And then he says, how much more then? If that's before him, if that's before him, 
How much more then? The hearts. He doesn't say the demise. He says the hearts of the children of men. In my opinion, he's not talking about Israel there. Men's usually used in a, in a generic way, in a, in a large way, when you see that. In my opinion, he's talking about, they may go there, but I don't want them to. Oh, I wish we had more time to look into it. All right, so let's... Uh, Let's go another couple of minutes, okay? Uh, still eight minutes till, so I think that's what, maybe 10, 12 minutes till, I can't tell. Maybe it's 20 till. <laughs> Wasteful thinking, preacher. All right, let's go on. Notice verse, uh, let's see, that's hell and destruction. Verse 16 then. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble. Not spend a lot of time on that. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble. So what is the basic understanding? Somebody give me a commentary on that real fast. Better is little. Does that mean that you're not righteous if you have a great deal of things? No, no. He's just giving a commentary to say what? Better is little with, uh, with, fear, with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble. What's he really talking about? Blessings of the Lord. Addeth no sorrow. Passage that's used a lot of times in weddings. Okay. Um, somebody else help me out. Okay. And he's exactly right. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble. What often happens with great treasure? Pride. Pride need or greed. What else? I'm sorry? Rust and decay. What else? Lust, self-reliance. Self <laughs> yeah. What else? Do people ever get jealous when you have a lot? Do relatives ever get jealous when you have a lot? Do children ever get jealous when you have a lot? Yeah. Do they do bad things sometimes? Very bad things sometimes. He's not saying that it's wicked to have a lot. I've known some, and not well, but I've known some very wealthy people. The Reese's, I think I've talked about them, that own Reese's Hitch. Uh, they don't anymore. They sold it off. But uh, Mr. Reese that, that invented it many, many years ago, I didn't meet him. He died quite a few years ago. But Reese is probably the number one hitch around the world for trailer hitches and that kind of thing. And uh, you can buy them about any, any hardware store or anything else that sells hitches. But I did meet his son. He's with the Lord now, too. I met him. He was in his 80s. And uh, he's a rel relative of one of my staff members up in Asheville. And so I had the privilege of meeting him. And uh, extremely wealthy folks. And yet love God with all their hearts. And they were doing their best to invest their, the wealth that they had in godly missionaries around the world, in godly colleges, in different places of the world. And just, I, I sat there with him, with Mr. Reese and his wife, in a double-wide trailer down in Florida. And they have a nice home up in Indiana, but they, in the wintertime, they would go to Florida living in a double-wide trailer, not, in, not overlooking the ocean or anything like I would think. You know, they got all this money. They'd probably live out on an island somewhere. But a little double-wide trailer along with a bunch of other trailers around them. Nice place. It was nicely kept. And yet we talked about the Lord. It was wonderful. So there's nothing wrong with having wealth, but when the wealth has you. And he is saying, you're better off if you don't have anything, but you have the Lord. There's another New Testament verse that gives clear clarity to that for me. Matthew chapter 6, what verse? But seek ye first, what? And his, and, which implied in that, at least I infer in that, whether I have little or I have lot. But especially in the context, he's dealing with your house, he's dealing with your clothing, he's dealing with your food. He says, do you not know that even the lilies of the field, do you not know how? And he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So that's what he's talking about here. Let's continue on very quickly. 
Uh, verse 25, only two more to go. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the wicked. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the, win of the widow. I said wicked, didn't I? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm going to be in trouble tonight. All right, uh, you're going to have several right after me after that. May I talk to you, preacher? Uh, I am not wicked. As far as I know, I am a widow, but not wicked. All right. Okay, so let's look at it, and I'll read it correctly. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. Let me just read you what I wrote for myself. Widows frequently live in humble circumstances. Not always, but frequently. Maybe they're on Social Security. Maybe they don't even have that, hardly. Many are the sheep. Widows frequently live in humble circumstances. So he understands. He established. Okay? Notice what it says, the word established there. I looked it up. It means to station himself or to take one side, to station oneself. In other words, if I was going to station myself tonight, I would do it right alongside Brother Travis here. I'm stationing, I'm coming alongside, I'm stationing myself alongside him. Okay? Notice with that in mind what he says. He says, the Lord will destroy the house of the proud. He's going to bulldoze it over. Not literally, maybe so. But he's going to do it. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth of that shall he also what? He destroyeth. The house of the proud, but he will come alongside. He will come to the side of. He stations himself beside the border of the widow. Border in the New Testament, especially in the Old Testament, it has this idea in mind. If you had, let's say, a rectangle and you were putting a fence around it, you're putting a border around it. Okay, let's say it's an acre. Okay, you're putting a fence around that acre. Okay. The word border here has the idea that it borders in everything that needs to, be, to belong there. It borders out everything that's not to be in there. Notice what he says. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud. I mean, it's, I mean, it's leveled. But he will establish. He's going to come alongside. He's going to station himself. He will come along. He will establish the border of the widow. What he is saying here, friend, is that he's using a widow here because oftentimes they're, they are in humble circumstances. But when you and I walk with the Lord, just like we've seen already in these verses, we don't have to worry about that. He's going to border in everything we need. 2 Peter 1. He's already provided everything we need for life and godliness. Six Matthew 6.33 we've talked about. Many other places. And then let's go to the last one. Proverbs 15.6. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. But notice the last. But. The words of the pure are pleasant words. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. Now, if we're going to be consistent, it's a contrast, okay? So it's talking about how does this, how does this appear to the Lord? He says the thoughts of the wicked, their imaginations, their, their uh, calculations, what they're planning on doing. I'm going to look at that. Uh, movie, even though I know it's got stuff in it. All right, it's wicked. All right, I'm going to steal that. That's wicked. Their thoughts before it's ever acted upon, I'm going to be bitter. And whatever it is, he says, the thoughts of the wicked, and notice this is the third time in this chapter he uses an abomination, are an abomination to the Lord. But notice what he says in contrast to that. The words of the pure are pleasant words. And in my opinion, he's talking about to the Lord. The Lord loves to hear your words and mine. When those pure words, they're pure words, 
but they come out of the reservoir of a pure heart. The Bible speaks elsewhere about everything that comes out comes out of a pure heart. In other words, you have a ladle. Let's say it's a ladle of words. And the reservoir is purity. It's godly purity. There's nothing that defiles in that, bella, in that, in that uh, vase or in that, uh, that kettle or whatever it is. Everything in there is pure. And so for the godly, their thoughts are to, are to come out of that. And if there's anything, any foreign thing that's going to try to enter into it that has a defilement, oh, it's rejected before it gets into the ladle. But he says here, the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. Ah. But the words, the pure words, the words of the pure are pleasant. And in my opinion, consistent with the text, they're pleasant to the Lord. When you go to someone on Sunday and you're not trying to make them think better of you, you just know that's my sister in Christ. That's my brother in Christ. And you have pure words out of a pure heart. It's not a, oh, they're going to think better of me. They're going to invite me out to eat. They're going to give me a, a job. They're going to whatever. No, they're pure words. It says here, in my opinion, it delights the Lord. Now, with that in mind, let me go back over these seven. And let's preface all of these. I'm going to give a little phrase for each one. And this is what tickled my heart, if I could put it that way. Because really, when you look at all the contrast, the bad side of the contrast, it's oh, blah, 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 all the way through. But when you look at the right side of the contrast, that has God's name attached to it. Oh, it brings about rejoicing. So here's the seven phrases I came up with. Well, I asked the Lord to help me with. All right? Rejoice. Verse number, chapter 15, verse 3. Rejoice. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Rejoice because the Lord knows your good in the company of those that are otherwise. You can rejoice in that. You can be smack dab in the middle. Smack dab's in the Hebrew, I think. You can be smack dab in the middle, not by way of getting yourself into temptation, but in uh, things going around you. Even as Miss McCullough said today, we're living in a wicked world, aren't we, preacher? And I said, yes, ma'am, we are. But you and I, smack dab in the middle of a wicked world, can rejoice. Why? Because we know that God is everywhere, beholding the evil and the good, and He knows, He knows what's going on in my life. All right? Number two, 15.8. The sacrifice of the wicked is abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. How can we rejoice? We rejoice because the Lord hears. Number one, we rejoice because the Lord knows. Number two, we rejoice because the Lord hears. What does it say? But the, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Isn't that neat? Number three, the Lord loves. Remember, hell and destruction before the Lord, how much more than the hearts, how much more than the, law, than the hearts of the children of men. So number one, the Lord knows. Number two, the Lord hears. Number three, the Lord loves. We have every reason to rejoice tonight, don't we? I don't know if this is making sense. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope it will be a blessing to you. 15, 16, better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith, Matthew 6, 33. How can we rejoice? Not only that he, uh, that he knows and he hears and he loves, better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure. The Lord provides. Doesn't he? It may be thoughts. I have to pray regularly, 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 regularly for wisdom on what to preach, how to preach, what counsel to give. The Lord provides. You may have to provide, ask the Lord for food. You may have to ask the Lord for clothing. You may have to ask the Lord for a job. You may ask the Lord for protection. You can rejoice. Go ahead and rejoice. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, is it not? Faith is not really a substance. Faith is an intangible. Substance is a tangible. But for the child of God, he can go ahead and act as though God is already at work 
bringing the tangible to the intangible so that the things which are seen are not, and the things which are not are seen. The God knows what they are before He even makes it. And it's as good as real already. He provides. And then the last one, uh, last two. The Lord will destroy the house of the good, but He will establish the border of the widow. Of the, of the widow. I'll get it out. And that is the Lord establishes. He does. He borders you in. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to. You can say, okay, Lord, here we go. You want me to go so winning? I can go so winning. You want me to be a blessing to people across the aisle here that I don't know and they're going to think I'm weird because I'm going up to them? That's all right. I'm bordered in. If I do it righteously, God will use that. And then finally, the thoughts of the wicked are abomination of the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. Why can we rejoice? Yes, because the Lord knows, because the Lord hears, because He loves, He cares, He establishes, and the Lord delights. Imagine that. The God, the Lord who spoke the stars into existence. The, the God who just allowed our little camera to go boop, 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 out a little ways from here. And boy, we've seen the universe as we've never seen it. All right? Because we're little spots on this planet. And that little camera went way out into the universe, out of the galaxy or whatever. And, and that's nothing. But he delights in your prayers and in mine. Can you imagine that? What a God of love. What a power there is in prayer. Amen? There is power in prayer. Well, with that in mind, let's do some of that then. All right, we still have about 12 minutes and so let's go ahead and take our prayer requests at this time, and um, we'll do that. All right. So, any prayer requests at this time? Yes, ma'am. Continue to pray for my sister Marina. Okay. Tomorrow we have a meeting with three different doctors. Uh, Dr. Jones is very concerned about her. And tell us her name again. Marina. Marina. Okay, let's pray for Miss Lorena. And I think you said she's saved. Yes. Yes, okay, good. Okay. Someone else? Yes, sir. Uh, well, uh, Emily, our daughter, called this afternoon. Emily, who's had the heart cath yesterday. Mm -hmm. And she couldn't get stents in. They have a bicycle bike back at the Okay, very good. Any others? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Maya, would you say it again, please? Uh, oh, a doctor's appointment. Okay, let's pray for our sister with a doctor. Is that coming up this, this week? All right, let's pray for our sister. Okay, that'll be a delight for us. Okay, someone else? Any others? Any others? Miss Sylvia. Um, keep my family in your prayers. My grandfather passed away last night. And um, my dad has been in the hospital. Um, Did you say your grandmother passed away? Grandfather. Grandfather. I'm sorry. Oh, no. This is your dad? Oh. I'm sorry. I sure appreciated Miss Sylvia. She and the children went out door-to-door -door soul winning. And those children, I, I, they were on the opposite side of the street. And Miss Sylvia doesn't know this, so don't, Miss Sylvia, don't cry, okay? Her, uh, because it's going to be a shock. Her children have a lot of energy. All right. 
They stood there. I didn't, I wasn't there the whole time. But when I saw them, they were there at the front door. They were there very polite and were being very polite. And as, as Miss Sylvia and my wife were there and, and uh, talking about the Lord Jesus. And so I was very, very pleased. Glad that they were there. All right. Others. Let's, any others? Yes, ma'am. Okay, any others? Yes, ma'am. Um, my friend Joe Jones, who just got breast cancer and had a double mastectomy and going for surgery tomorrow. Okay. Let's pray for this friend of Michelle's. Surgery tomorrow. She already had a double mastectomy, but having to go back for a further procedure tomorrow. Okay. Do you know if she's saved or not, Miss Michelle? She's not. No, I say, oh my. Okay. Jesus saw the Jew. The Jew? Okay. All right. All right. Any others? Any others? These have been good. Let's pray for Sister Travis. She's not been able to be with us for a little bit. So let's pray for her sister. Okay. All right. We still have several folks who are going through the COVID thing and, and either getting over it and family getting over it or whatever. So it just, boy, it just seems like it's taken a toll on us over the last couple of months, hasn't it? Yes, sir. Let's pray for his grandmother. What's her last name? Pierce. Carol Pierce. Okay. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Okay. You're beating me to it. Okay. Miss Helen says, let's pray for our nation. Okay. And I was just about to say, let's pray for a couple of things. Pray for Calvary Baptist Church. Um, how many of you believe the Lord is wanting to use this ministry? Do you? Amen. How many believe we're positioned maybe to begin really asking God to do a work here and seeing a work done? Amen? Amen. Amen. So it requires every one of us to stay right with the Lord and right with each other. And, uh, and then and move forward. And uh, forgetting those things which are behind. Good, bad, or ugly. Um, it just... When I moved here, I had a box full of notes that young people had written uh, when I was at, at Ambassador. And they were very kind in some of the words they said. I just, because I, I loved them and they loved me and like they do all the professors there. But, um, and, and I started to keep it. I kept it in a little box. I keep mints in that box now for folks that come that have peanut allergies. And my, so I can give it to them in my office. But I determined, you know what? Uh, God's, God's led me to this place, and, and I, had some, I had four wonderful years there. God was so good and never planned on leaving, but that's not where God has me now. God has me here. I want all my attention and all my affection, everything I have to offer, what little bit that is, but whatever I have to offer, good, bad, or ugly, it's, I want it to be here. And so I'm going to set those things behind. Maybe some things are not so good to set behind sometimes too and say, okay, that was yesterday. That was last month. That was last decade. Well, there's good, bad, or whatever, forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward toward the mark of the prize of the high calling. So we have a job to do. Amen? Amen. And that's to tell folks about Jesus and love the ones that God sends to us and going out of our way, whether they've been here two days or 20 years, loving them through the Lord sometimes. They're not easy to love. That's okay. I'm not easy to love sometimes. Neither are you. Every once in a while. I would never think that, but maybe so. So let's ask God to give us that extra measure of grace as we ask God to send revival to this ministry. I believe we're, we're on the threshold of that. A little bit to go yet, I think. A little bit to go. But we're going to get there, Lord willing. All right. So here's what we're going to do. Let's pray for our country. Let's pray for our church. Let's pray for souls. 
And, uh, and then we're going to see some things done. Um, so let's do this. I'm going to ask if the ladies will team up with maybe one other...